So good morning, everyone. Welcome back to another Earth to Class. We're welcoming back also Dr. Dorothy Petit from Vermont. And she's going to talk to us about what happened during deglaciation at the New Jersey, New York border, time and environment of ice sheet melt. So there are two kinds of people who enjoy pollen, allergists and palynologists. Palynologists, including Dorothy, are people who study pollen. I think when the computer is shut off, someone goes in and makes typing changes. So they keep coming up with errors. But over 20,000 years ago, much of North America was covered by the Laurentide ice sheet. And we know where it ended from the terminal moraine. As the ice sheets move forward, they pile up a lot of rock and debris. And in our area, the terminal moraine runs across what became Long Island as sea level rose and filled in a hill. It also runs through Staten Island into New Jersey and across New Jersey. Other evidence of where the glacier was include erratics, like this very large one here, and glacial striations, scratches on bedrocks that form as the glacier pushes over the bedrock and the rocks on the bottom of the glacier create the scratches. Pollen. Pollen grains are the male gametophytes, microgametophytes of seed plants, which produce the male gametes, the sperm cells. They have a hard coat which protects them during the process of their movement from the stamens to the pistil of flowering plants or from the male cone to the female cones of coniferous plants. <laughs> and different types of plants have pollens which are very distinctive and palynologists are able to learn to identify them. The pollens are extremely small. In this microphotograph you see the material can 10 microns. To get pollen sometimes what we do is core. This is a stock picture, not from our area. But here's a picture of some of the students who've worked with Margaret, Margie, down at uh, the Tolman Salt Marsh out here on the Piermont Pier. And I know that Dee has uh, taken groups of students down there and poured in the salt marsh to learn more about the history of the salt marsh. When the ice sheets began to melt, they exposed bare rock. And gradually, pioneer plants, particularly lichens and mosses, began to cover the bare rocks. And then over time, it turned into a tundra biome, which we still have in polar areas and high peaks. Marianne, you don't live in the tundra part of the Adirondacks, right? I do not. I do not, fortunately. Um, actually, I'm at about 1,500 uh, or so feet above sea level. Oh, uh, that's nothing in the Adirondacks. Some of the high peaks are well over 5,000 feet. And if you're there, even though you're in New York, you're in a tundra environment. Tundra eventually gives way to the Taiga, the Northern Coniferous Forest. And we have a variety of evergreen trees. In here, there are cones. There are male cones and female cones. Pollen is produced in the male cones. 
rather than in flowers. And then in our area, eventually the taiga gave way to the deciduous biome, which we refer to as the eastern woodlands. We have a variety of broadleaf trees, which are the common ones we have now. So with that introduction, I'm going to stop my screen share and try to go back to, here we are. Can you see my screen now? I'm about to make you co-host, so we should be able to. Yes, we have your screen. Okay. Thank um, you. Sure. Well, hi, everyone. And let me see if I can move that. Yeah, the people pictures. Um, thank you for inviting me. And uh, it's going to be fun to talk to you today because I think, well, most of you live around here, right? Or you know the environment uh, around New York. Everybody's pretty uh, familiar with the New York environment. Yeah. I've always been uh, fascinated by history and I did my thesis in coastal Alaska in near Yakutat and the Malaspina Glacier and the Bering Glacier. This is the picture of the Bering Glacier. And so it's nice, I kept, when I kept going back and forth from Alaska, it, you, you see exactly um, what, what was happening 15,000 years ago, uh, when, you, when you go back to the Alaskan uh, coastline and you can really imagine New York in that situation. So I wanna take you through some of the things we're working on and the puzzles that we're left with and how we're gonna try to solve them. Let's see, how do I move this forward? Oh, there it is, yeah. So the question we first asked was, when did the ice sheet melt? The only dates that were available by people like Serkin, and um, there's a site I'm gonna show you, Francis Lake, were bulk dates. And bulk dates means that the, uh, just a handful of mud was submitted to a radiocarbon lab. And what's the problem with that, and we'll come back to that, is that it's a mixture of roots and you know, um, old things and young things. And a new technique has come, which is accelerator mass spectrometry dating that allows us to uh, narrow down one tiny spruce needle, for example, and date it. So that's what got me interested because we had a new technique to say, what can we learn about when the ice melted from coring lakes? And from these same lake cores and bog cores, we can reconstruct the environmental history um, and see what kinds of plants were growing there. So I was trained as a botanist. I love plants and uh, learning about them. And what I really like is getting out in the field because I'm always um, faced with something that I don't understand. <laughs> And it's wonderful to go back and forth and keep questioning yourself. So I want to go through our methods a little bit and then the results. So this is another picture of the Bering. If you don't know that area of Alaska, it's really a fantastic place. The Bering Glacier and the Malaspina Glacier each are about the size of Rhode Island. So the scale of everything is just incredible. Um, so why do we care? One of the reasons is that we want to understand how, how plants move in. Like as Mike uh, pointed out, we have this sort of standardized idea of tundra and then forest and then uh, boreal forest and then temperate. But how did it actually work? What, what does the evidence say? And then we, had, <clears throat> we have a controversy at Lamont actually between the carbon 14 dates and the beryllium dates that people are getting and the VARV chronologies. So it's, it's an exciting puzzle um, to, 
to get at the timing. And then it's also critical to understand how the, the whole system works, how the climate system works, how um, warm does it have to get for the ice sheet to melt and the ocean we found out is involved in this. And so putting the whole global puzzle together of melting and climate variability becomes a bigger picture puzzle. So we know you've probably seen this record is on the left is the present and going back in time, this is an ice core record from Greenland of isotopes. But generally the temperature is represented by the isotopic shift. And you can see we've had a lot of flips in climate over the last 100,000 years. Um, of course, we haven't gotten as warm as we are today because now we're off this chart. This Greenland core was taken in the 80s. But this YD is the Younger Dryas, which I don't know if you've heard of, but that was a cold snap. In this picture, it looks almost as cold as the Ice Age, but it wasn't. In New York, we can tie it exactly to four degrees, and the Ice Age was much colder than that here. So, um, but it shows you basically the variability, and we wanted to see what the magnitude of um, how cold was it, what plants were growing here right after. And of course, we're getting a lot of Greenland melt now. There is a really exciting idea out here that we may have this freshwater melt may um, make a shallow lid. And Wally Broker's paper in 1985 showed that if you get a cool freshwater lid on the North Atlantic, you can stop this deep water formation which um, is responsible for transporting a lot of uh, heat uh, down to the bottom of the ocean and then around the globe. And that's what happened in the Younger Dryas. The meltwater made a freshwater lid and it cooled the atmosphere throughout the whole Northern Hemisphere. So that's another sort of big picture thing we're looking at. Now, what were the dates for right here in New York area, New York, Connecticut, New Jersey? Well, the bulk dates, as I told you, which was just a hunk of mud, all dated between in radiocarbon years, 18 to 22,000. And in calendar years, that's more like 21 to 23,000 um, or even more than that. So, People often say, well, when did the ice sheet melt? Maybe around 20,000. That's probably from these ages. Um, our dates, and I'm gonna show you how we got them, all date, um, the previous dates that we had in the 90s to about 12,000. Well, that's a huge difference, right? So we wanted to go back and get more dates and see if we could bridge this from 23,000, but that was based on an old mixture of dates um, to see uh, if we could get more dates to understand this. Then there's a VARV floating chronology. And if you don't know what a VARV is, it's a laminated layer in a lake. And people count these kind of like tree rings. But the question is, are they annual or can you have extra ones? They're formed by seasonal melt. So generally there's a, a coarse layer that melts out in the summer and then a fine layer. I'll show you some pictures. But when Jack Ridge, who's at Tufts University, started counting varves and extrapolating down here to New York, he got 28,000 for the timing of ice retreat. So that pushes it back even further. And then the beryllium data that has come out, and this is um, including some people at Lamont, Jörg Schaefer, uh, another guy named Balko, um, who's not at Lamont, but their dates uh, came out to be, again, very old, 24 to 20,000. And around here they had 
Uh, this is not published to my knowledge, but a date of about 19,000. So again, this discrepancy is really big. So there was a, in 2007, I got a geologist named Dyke who, um, oops, let me go back, who made this pretty map of the timing of ice retreat. And you can see in radiocarbon dating, and if you don't know, there's just a calibrator to change radiocarbon dates to calendar dates. So this was all made in radiocarbon chronology, but if you change it, I've put the dates over here. So this dark blue color would be 21,000. A little bit lighter blue is um, 20. And then right here along the margin is 19, according to these old bulk dates and the map that he had. Uh, but down here is 21 and over here is 21. And this is just the contour map again with these ages on it. So if, if you wanted to go back and try to redate this, I've looked on, um, well, we should go to Martha's Vineyard. We've been coring in Nantucket because these moraines are over here to the east. They follow each other and across Long Island. And so far, we don't have any good lake records. I've cored on Long Island, but hit outwash. So we have to go to the North Shore um, where we don't have all this outwash from the glacier. We haven't done that yet. But where we have gone are all these red dots. Um, and these are where we have new dates. Well, this paper was written in 2012 and we've done some work since there. Uh, on lake records, we core, I'll show you what the sediment looks like. And we are only, I'm only going to be showing you the dates that are in the glacial clay. So they're plants, they're tundra plants mostly in the clays that we've dated with AMS dating to get the timing of the ice retreat. So some places like right at Lamont across the street, there's a Boy Scout camp. If any of you know Lamont besides Michael. Um, and there, that's a swamp there, it's a black ash swamp. And we took a core of about 13 meters deep. Um, and first, before we had radiocarbon AMS dating, we had a bulk date that was 12,500. We went back there and then got an accelerator date. So I'll show you that one. Another one is um, Lindsley Pond near Yale, which had been previously cored and they had a bulk date. Then I went out and in Staten Island, there's right on the moraine, there's a little bog or a fen that we cored. I'll show you results from that. Uttertown Bog in New Jersey, Alamuchi Pond. And then I've just found, I'm excited so I can tell you about this. We're gonna core a bog that's right on the moraine pretty soon um, when we get permission. And that'll give us, uh, an even better date, I think. And then we've cored all of these sites in Black Rock, Sutherland Pond, Sutherland Fen, and up near Mohawk. We've actually cored Minnewaska and Mohawk, but they, um, they don't have good stratigraphy back uh, that far because the cores are so short compared to our long records here. They were only like a meter or two. And then these uh, green dots are other sites in the area that people have bulk dates on. Francis Lake is one. Um, and then these yellow dots are bulk dates without pollen stratigraphy to try to line it up. So here's the Alpine Swamp record across the street from Lamont. And what you see generally is this um, let me go over the axes. This is depth. So this first core was about 10.8 meters deep. And um, the stratigraphy is here in terms of the core type. This is, uh, can you see my pointer? Yes. You can? Okay. This is clay on the, on the bottom. And then you see it turns into Yitya, this lake sediment. 
And then towards the top, you get into a woody peat that's the swamp. Um, we burn the samples and you can see these are less than 5% organic. So it's just solid clay almost in the bottom. And that's the glacial clay when the ice melted and the fine rock pieces fall out and form a clay. Was that uh, glacial lake Hackensack? No, because it's south of that. Okay. It's up on the ridge, you know, it's right by Lamont. So it's right. too high for Hackensack. So the pollen shows that there's, these are pollen types across and the percents are on the bottom x-axis. There was about 70% pine. But what we also do besides look at pollen is we look at macrofossils and there's no pine in the macrofossils. So we know it was blowing from further south or further east out on the shelf. Um, there's also some spruce pollen, that's Picea. Not much else here except for some tundra. And I don't know if I showed the other, we have um, sedge and grass, so a tundra environment. And then what I want, just generally want to show you is spruce increases here where the sediment gets more organic. And that was a bulk date of about 12,800. But I also want to show you, this was the one first core that showed us a younger dryas in North America, in the US here, because we had oak increasing. So it was warming, but then here's this return to coal conditions where oak goes to almost nothing, but you have spruce, fir, alder, and birch. And we proved that it was um, um, white birch. Uh, the, by the macrofossils that was, so we could um, estimate the temperature shift here for younger dryas um, because we can look at this pollen assemblage in the Adirondacks or in the White Mountains and it would be a four degree shift. So let's go back to this clay environment in the bottom of the core. The same thing we see in Lindsley Pond, Connecticut. Here again is the high pine. Here's spruce going up to 60% in this site. Here's this younger dryas, you can see that. And then the dates, AMS dates we got at the very bottom in the clay were 12,590. There's a big error bar, but as you can see, it's still um, pretty young. We published that in, let's see, in the 90s uh, on that core, because we took these cores looking for younger dryas evidence, not for the timing of the base of the core. But then uh, my colleague, Terry Ann Menza Gamelch, I helped her core a Sutherland Pond in Black Rock Forest, and she counted the pollen. And again, if you look closely, you'll see this is oak here increasing. It was getting warmer after the ice had melted way down here. And then you had this return to coal conditions again with alder and fir and spruce. Um, and that's the younger dryas there. And she dated it in her cores and it came out to match the younger dryas we had. But I want you to focus now on the bottom part of that core. This core goes back 10.75 meters. So these are deep lake cores. And again, you see the percent loss on ignition, uh, how much burns off again, 95%. Uh, so it's pretty much pure clay. Again, you have pine pollen blowing in, but this is sedge, which is 40%, and that's a tundra environment again. So that was in the 90s. So, but there was nothing to date at the bottom of this. And look, take a look, this is about 8.5 meters to 10. So two meters below, but nothing to date in those clays. So now I want to take you to, this is Alpine, uh, some of the others that we looked at. And this is Alamuchi here, Uttertown. Green Pond is up in Harriman. Spruce Pond, these are to the north. <clears throat> and just to show you what some of the pollen looks like, here's the pine, Mickey Mouse pollen. 
we count 300 pollen grains per sample, and then we make these pollen percentage diagrams. But the most important thing I think for, for understanding what plants are there are the macrofossils because they don't blow around. Um, so they give us taxonomic, which species, not just any pine, but which pine or which spruce, and the spatial and the temporal precision. Um, so here's some pictures of the macrofossils we find. This is dwarf birch, which is a tundra species. This is the little cone brat. And this is dryas, which the younger dryas is named for. And now we can date just one of these and get a very precise time interval for the deglaciation. So this is just one page of, I think it's a three page list of all the dates that we got. And I compiled all the bulk dates as well as the AMS and what we dated. So for example, in Alpine, when we went back in cord, we have an AMS uh, date on a spruce needle in the clay. Um, and Alamuchi, here's another one, a spruce needle in the clay, 14,463. This one's a similar date, 14,700. Um, here's an old bulk date of Francis Lake. And again, the sediment amount is always much bigger in these older dates and 19,000. Here's a new date from Green Pond um, on a wood piece that's 14,000 and on a seed of elderberry Sambucus pubens, which is 14,000. So that's, I just wanted to show you one of the charts we have. The paper has more if you're, if you're interested. And then um, here's the moraine going across Staten Island and then up west into New Jersey. So you can see it's very well mapped. Byron Stone mapped it. And now I wanna show you some of the stratigraphy from these sites. This is Green Pond right at the boundary from um, nine to eight meters. You can see it's sharp here. It's not always that sharp, but you can imagine how the organic matter just suddenly comes in and that's because it's warming. So trees or, or tundra are around the site. They fall into the pond and we can date the things that fall in, but also the aquatics, uh, the, the pond is coming to life. So you have algae and you have um, all kinds of the food chain supported by the algae to support that organic um, material. Okay, and then this is green pond stratigraphy. So on the left, the y-axis has, it's 9.7 meters deep. And I only worked on the bottom of these for this project because again, I wanted to see what's the first thing that comes in. So I've color coded, the first thing we see are insect remains and moss. Um, and here, and a lot of pebbles you can see within the clay. And the loss on ignition here when you burn it is very tiny in all this part. We don't find something big enough to date until here. And it dated 12,250. And it was dryas leaves, I think, because here the dryas. I've made the blue circles showing tundra species. Okay, so the first thing we have again are pebbles, rocks, uh, insect parts, bryozoans. I'm going to show you what they look like. And I can identify some of the mosses. It's hard to identify mosses. I'm still working on a lot of them. Um, but then the second thing are these tundra species. So this is dryas leaves. I'll show you what they look like. There's willow here. There's, um, let's see, this is Sambucus, the elderberry here. Um, and carry off lacy, that's a tundra family here. And then way here, we also get a pine, a pine needle, a two needle pine, which is Banksiana the northernmost pine. But then when the organic, when it really starts to get organic again, 10% or so, that's when you start to get all these trees coming in. Spruce, um, needles, 
spruce sterigmata, those are the little tiny sort of petioles that attach to the um, branch. Seeds, spruce, uh, fir needles, and here's another pine needle. So in this case, we do find one pine needle way down, um, but again, it's pretty young, right? 12,500. So now I wanted to show you some of the things. This is the pebbles. This is a moss fragment here. Um, and I haven't gone back to identify this one actually. And then bryozoans. And if you know about bryozoans, they're amazing. They make these little overwintering uh, statoblasts that then they regenerate from the next year. They're kind of a, a combination between a animal and a plant. I'll, I have a slide in just a minute. I'll show you. And then the insect macrofossils, which we thought at first were beetle parts, turned out to be crane flies. Those are those um, sort of, it looks like a giant mosquito and they eat a lot of plant debris, I think. I don't know if they eat animal debris, but they came in. Unfortunately, we can't use them for a um, temperature indicator because they range today from the Arctic all the way down here. So they don't give us an indication of the actual temperature. And then these are the bryozoans. Um, we've, I've, this photo actually is from Lake Sebago and Harriman. They grow underwater. They're sort of like corals and uh, less than 2% of them are freshwater, but they're genetically very puzzling. And here's an old uh, drawing I love. And this shows the statoblasts. And these are what we find. They're about a millimeter, some of them are two millimeters. So they're a lot of fun and you can, you can identify them to the species level actually. Here are the crane flies. Um, and again, I, I, they do feed on moss and algae and um, detritus. And then um, just to go back, that's the general stratigraphy. And that's generally what we see um, here's some rubus seeds up when you start to get trees, you get rubus is the rose family. So this is like um, blackberries and violet seeds. It's really interesting to see how the sites vary from site to site. So that's green pond, which is up. I take my class up there um, in our wetlands class to see. It's a bog that's sort of filling in that used to be a lake. Now the tundra dryas, this is one species of dryas that we often find. This is a photo I took up in Alaska and the fruits are really interesting. Sometimes we find the fruits and you can see the little uh, dryas leaves as well. This is the dwarf birch and here's a um, the leaf, we sometimes find the edge of these very distinctive leaves or twigs that we can date. And then here's the little cone, uh, female cone, and that's one of the little um, cone scales. What's fascinating is uh, there are about five or six birches in our area, and you can tell all the birches about uh, apart by the shapes of their cone scales. So for kids, for if you're thinking about kid projects in your classes, these are fantastic things for kids to do to get to learn the plants around them is to make a seed collection or a um, catkin select, uh, collection of their own. Another plant we find is uh, in the blueberry family, Vaccinium oleaginosum, um, and that's a typical leaf that we find and they're preserved perfectly. This leaf is 12,000 years old, and yet you can see the venation often. So what are the distributions of these? And to help us estimate temperature change, you can see this is dry us coming down the uh, Rockies out here. And over here, we don't see it except, uh, I think it might be in the White Mountains. It's in the Appalachians a little bit and then the Maritimes. Um, dwarf birch, you can see also has a really northerly distribution as does um, Vaccinium oliginosum. 
And willow buds are great for dating too because they're thick, they're leathery. They kind of look like a mitten. Um, okay, so again, I think we've shown you that stratigraphy from Green Pond. This, I wanted to show you the difference between a spruce needle, this one's white spruce, which has a very pointed tip and a fir needle, which has no tip. So that's why in a Christmas tree situation, if you shake hands with a spruce tree, you'll get stuck. Uh, if you shake hands, if you have a, a fir that smells so wonderful, you won't get poked by the needles. And then the, this is a typical fossil seed wing. You can see the preservation again, or this alder seed, which is very distinctive in its shape. And again, the distributions of these trees, um, white spruce, you can see is above, it's north of where we live now. People plant spruces in their yards, but they're generally different species that are able to survive our hot summers. And larch, uh, it's one of the deciduous conifers, you can see. And then fir, which has its cones, oops, um, vertical on the branches. That's one easy way to tell a fir from a spruce where the cones are hanging down. So this is a photo I took near the, um, not the Malaspina, the Matanuska Glacier in Alaska further south. And you can see that uh, dryas can grow right, a, right where they are trees. These are all trees. So it's not necessarily meaning that it's colder than um, a tree, boreal tree environment. Sometimes they grow together. And then this is the jack pine, the pine needle that I told you we found. Um, it's amazing. I just identified a um, a spruce needle in, in Germany that's 100,000 years old, I think. So you, these, these needles can survive for thousands and thousands of years in a lake where, and the reason they're all preserved is that it's anoxic and it's cold in the bottom of the lake. So it's a great area for preservation. So now I think we go to, that was Green Pond, I think we go to Uttertown next. Yeah. So in Uttertown, again, the first things we see at the bottom, this core is about the same uh, length, nine meters. There's pebbles, there are insect parts again. There's Daphnia, for those of you who know lake um, ecology, know that they're um, little creatures that uh, are feeding on algae and other things. And they have a resting stage as well, epiphia, which they reproduce from. I think I have a picture of that, I'll show you. And then these, I haven't gone back and identified all the moss, but along with them or after that, in this pink clay, and here there are two colors of clay showing that there are different sources of rocks. Um, we have these aquatics that show up, water lilies, uh, two different kinds, and nias, which is, I think, a water weed, it's called. So those seeds show up. And then we start to get the increase in organic again. And with that, we have the trees. So the first one that comes in here is larch, larix needles, and then spruce. And yeah, here's a picture again, bryozoan statoplast, daphnia, the crane fly heads, and this is the pebbles again. So again, this is all in the clay um, that we're finding these. And here are some pictures. This is a nias, a typical aquatic potamogeton, which some of you may know. There are a lot of potamogetons that are um, aquatic you know, underwater plants that are invasive in this area now. This is a tiny, tiny one millimeter carry off tundra seed. I don't have a picture of the plant. Um, and then this is a rubus. This is a blackberry seed, um, just to show you what they look like. And again, the distribution of these trees is pretty far north, as you can see. 
And then if any of you know Harriman along the throughway, this is a nice little kettle that we cord. Um, and it's the only one that has carbonate. So limestone in it, you can see the limestone above the gray clay at the bottom. And so this is just an example of the um, four of the different cores and the percent organic. So again, it's less than 5% before we go to this large increase when it warms up. And you can see that in some cases it's gradual. In, some, in Lindsley Pond, it was gradual and you have tundra going to spruce. In Uttertown, where I showed you the details, you have aquatics. You don't seem to have tundra in there. You have larch and then spruce. I mean, if we took other cores, it's possible you'd find it, the tundra zone. Um, but as I showed you, they can grow together. And I'm going to show you another photo of Alaska. You don't always have to have that sequence. Here's the um, green pond stratigraphy again. And high rock, this is the Staten Island one. And I have, I'm not going to go through all the details because we don't have time. But here's the tundra and spruce, again, less than 5%. So they're mixed together in that one before you get this rapid switch to to spruce. Um, and this one is Lindsley Pond, just to show you the younger dryas here, that where these, you know, coal species come back. And one of the things I wanted to point out is how rapidly things can change. Here, the paper birch, the larch, um, all just disappear. These are macrofossils again, and you get a white pine zone at the top uh, after the Younger Dryas. And you do have white pine here as it warmed up. Um, but before that, you just had tundra. I'm sorry, not tundra. You had uh, trees in this Lindsley Pond record and aquatics. You don't really see, well, you do have a grass and some polygonum, but not much typical tundra, not Dryas. I should mention Dryas needs calcium. So when I first went to Alaska and looked for dryas around the glacier, I didn't see it. And that's because it has to have calcium in the soil. Uh, okay, now we have the, the age axis going from right to left, 13,500 to 10,500. This is the Lindsley Pond, Connecticut. Some um, colleagues came to me and said, can we look at um, signals of fire in your record over this younger dryas. And so, and even the earliest, the timing of the earliest um, warming that we had. So here's fur, and that means it's cold and rather wet, especially in the younger dryas. The gray zone here is younger dryas. And here was our macrofossil record of charcoal. But what they looked at were different uh, using a different technique was black carbon, which showed that we had increases before the cold younger dryas and then increases afterwards. And then there was char and soot. You can see the soot really increased in the white pine zone. And they were very excited about this record showing that different plant communities can contribute differently to a smoldering or a flaming fire, and particularly flaming when you get to a, um, here, to, when you get to a, a hot uh, fire uh, with, with white pine. But let's go back then to the timing question. So here are these four records, <clears throat> and I don't have time to show you all 15, but in this case, <clears throat> The timing was the same in radiocarbon 12 to here as it is here. In other words, <clears throat> if we believe the dates, it accreted very rapidly. The ice melted really rapidly in this particular spot. And it melted about 14,000 from 14,400 to 14,100. I guess that's not 400 years or 300 years is not that rapid for a lake. 
but uh, those are the basal dates. Whereas here we get a big shift from 14.9 to, um, and this top date is 12,800. These two dates calibrated come out to be 16 and 15,000. So the oldest dates now that we had were around 16,000. Um, this is another record. Terry Ann mentioned, I mentioned Terry Ann Menza Gemeltz. I helped her core and she counted and did her thesis on this core. We then went to the bog to see how that would, this is in Blackrock Forest. Sutherland Pond, how that would compare. And we still haven't published this paper, but it's really interesting to compare the lake and the bog records. And just to show you the earliest date we got was 12,600 in um, radiocarbon, which, which translates to about 15,000. But the first things here were again, spruce remains, all spruce. Um, here's willow though, and that's a tundra uh, indicator sometimes, although we have willows that aren't. Um, then you can see we also, after that point, have spruce and fir together, even when it's the organic matter has increased substantially. And then up here, we get what the white pine zone that I mentioned to you with lots of needles and it goes on up to the top of the core. The last core that we looked at, I had a, a graduate student um, who did her thesis on um, Mia Alt. Well, actually it was a master's on Tamarack Pond in Black Rock Forest, for those of you who know it. And we cored this site in the summer, often we core in the winter, but this particular site was a bog and they flooded it. So now it's a pond. And we got the oldest date so far that we've gotten, which in calendar turns out to be almost 7,000 years old. And it has a very big tundra zone. This is all dry ass leaves. This is willow leaves, willow capsules, and willow buds. And then over here, these are mosses, uh, different mosses, sphagnum and polytricum and then bryozoan, statoblast, daphnia. You can see it was a lake way back here, even with very low, you can see the clay here. It was a lake that, that um, had just started. And again, the same thing, crane flies here. And they sort of peter out towards the top. But right after that, as you can see, right when the loss on ignition increases, the lake gets more organic you have boreal forest coming in and the tundra is gone. And then a younger dry ass again. So now we've pushed it back to 16,900. And this graph, <clears throat> I've plotted now the latitude of all the sites and the ages, right, in calendar age. So the old dates, the bulk dates are in blue and the AMS dates on individual things in the clays are red. And you can see that the red dates cluster really between 14 and seven, almost 17,000. So let's look at this chronological difference. It's five to 8,000 here, eight to 13,000 if we count the varves, and with beryllium four to 9,000 years different. Um, I can give you a little background. Beryllium's produced by cosmogenic rays in the atmosphere and rocks such as quartz uh, have uh, accumulate ber beryllium in them. So the way that you measure how much beryllium's in a rock is I think you dissolve the quartz. You have to use hydrofluoric acid and then count the number of beryllium atoms in it. And the production rate, they're assuming to be constant over time. Um, but let's go back a minute before we talk about that a little more and say, why are the bulk dates too old? Just to give you an example, I mentioned that they sometimes contain modern roots. 
This is a photograph I took from, we worked on Kodiak Island, Alaska, which is on the Western edge of the Gulf of Alaska. These layers that you see are tephra layers, volcanic ashes. And we could correlate um, different parts of the cliff around the island by the ashes. And then we could date what's in the peat and we could compare the pollen and the macrofossils. And then we could take just two cc's, a little bit of sediment, a bulk date and see what the difference was. And what we found, we, here's our purple tephra layer, our white tephra layer and our gray tephra. You can see these are very clear ashes. Here's where the ice pushed up and this became a lake here. But the, the ages um, for, these are the actual good ages, but the difference between little pieces of sediment and the, the um, individual seeds was two to 3,000 years or up to 5,000 years difference. And that's because Eric Grimm wrote a paper in 2009 that even in lakes that don't have carbonate in them, that, have, that would have old carbon, you can get these offsets, the conventional dates or the old bulk dates compared to the AMS. And these differences can be huge, several thousand years, even 5,000 years or more. And so when you have a, a pine uh, spruce um, stratigraphy and you're trying to see, for example, if you have a younger dryas, if the dates are wrong by several thousand years, you can see why people thought there was not a younger dryas because it would be the wrong age. And he corrected a lot of the dates in the Midwest showing that there was indeed a younger dryas because of this age offset between the bulk dates and the AMS dates. So we tried to look at this picture. The beryllium dates are coming out so much older. Was there some reason that these lakes and bogs were so young? We know the problem of bulk dates versus AMS and we believe the AMS, but maybe now we have AMS dates saying that the landscape didn't lose its ice until 15 or 16,000 or maybe 17 in that one. Is that because there were ice blocks? We know that ice blocks do exist. Um, and it was maybe a frozen landscape, but we don't see any trash layer that often when it does warm up, you see all the um, trash that builds up on, on a surface of a lake, just drop to the bottom. You would see that, you do see that if you have a melt out, a rapid melt out. But what we have to interpret, we think, is that the glacier was present in the Northeast in all of these sites until we see that clay. And that means the ice did not really leave until 17,000 minimum. This is a photo I took in front of the Malaspina Glacier and you can see how dynamic the whole thing is. This is the Forest Service guy I was walking with and it looks like a bulldozer, right? Had been around there. So it's just really interesting to think of what Staten Island, what the Hudson Valley looked like as the ice was melting. And this little plant that you see on the surface is alder, which fixes nitrogen. And um, a lot of the early plants like dryas, I think, fix nitrogen. Some of the blue-green algae definitely do. And you start to build up nitrogen in the soil so that the other plants can grow. So the question, and this is still something we're grappling with, why, why do these ages differ so much? The, as I mentioned, the beryllium production rates are possibly erroneous, or maybe the rocks that they're dating had previous beryllium from when before it was exposed um, to ice. So before it was buried, maybe it had built up beryllium from the atmospheric bombardment. Um, then we talked about the minimum ages. Maybe um, there were ice blocks. We don't see evidence for trash layers. Was the whole place frozen? We don't think that could happen for 5,000 years. Um, if the lake melted, if the ice melted, if the moraine, you know, the glacier moved northward, 
then plants come in because New Jersey's right there full of plants. It was not covered by ice and birds bring plants. So we think our dates represent the first um, evidence for <clears throat> um, ice retreat. Then I mentioned varves. The varves say that the ice left at 28,000 years and that's over 10,000 years earlier than our dates. But what I think might have happened, and um, I can't prove this at this point, is that sometimes in the Arctic, you have varves forming. So layers as the ice melts at the edges of lakes. Um, and you can form a varve even if the ice is not gone. So here are some examples of different uh, varves, the coarse layer and the, the fine layer. And there is no sequence of varves all the way to the Hudson Valley. They have to extrapolate based on varves they find in Lake Hackensack and Lake Connecticut. So when you add up all the varves, they're counting, they're 28,000 or 24,000, they say, 28,000, 24 but you're not actually counting them in a sequence. And if you had, um, and I, there's a, if you go to Jack Ridge's website, you can read all about this. If you had um, frozen lakes that still were melting at the edges in the summer, you could make a varv layer, which then could add up. And these are the frozen lakes in the Arctic. They do melt at the edge. They do form a lake, even under Antarctic ice in Lake Vostok or some of the lakes, they've found varves. And Antarctica is not deglaciated. So you can make layers under ice. And I think that's probably ha what happened in order to get 28,000 years. But another thing we did was to look south. When did, here's the moraine, but what was the climate like in the Appalachians and in Florida and in other areas? We don't have a lot of good records here, but when did things warm up? And so when we, we looked at these sites and in Florida, you can see, um, again, Eric Grimm had a paper showing these shifts in pine and oak and some of the other um, plants. And the interpretation was that this was a cold and dry and then we had a, a younger driest, but this would be the full glacial. So if you look at the best record for dating this, it comes out to be warming at 17,000, which fits pretty close with our warming up uh, in New York. And then you have, it slowly cooled again, and then you get a, um, this 14.7, which is close to the bowling warming of our, where all the lakes go organic basically and, and boreal forest moves in. Um, so let's look at an overview. What else is happening that we could look at? We, ha we don't get a consistent sea level rise until about 17,000. And we really don't see any evidence at all before 19,000. So if ice is melting around the world, it can't be melting at 28. It has to be melting post 20,000 from the sea level records. Here's the ice core record, which doesn't help us very much. Um, and then Jerry McManus's sea level record uh, down here shows some interesting points that we get uh, this cooling, which is the north, uh, meridional ocean circulation shutdown at this time period, which Wally Broker and others call the mystery interval. And then you get this bowling warming where we see all the lakes warm up. So it's during this time that we see this interesting, um, uh, our lakes opening up. Um, and then this record off of Portugal shows a cooling as well. Sea surface temperature drops compared to what it was before. So this was from our paper. I just wanted to show you the dates that we get 15 to 17. Well, now we've pushed it back at the, the oldest it could possibly be so far is 17,000. 
here's the ice core record again, the um, sea surface temperature records, this Jerry McManus's record of overturning of this cool North Atlantic. And then this is the insulation record and the Florida record of pine. So we really don't see any warming in the, in the South before about 17. And here again, the beryllium, there was another paper pushing the beryllium dates back even further towards the VARV dates. So we're still in this big controversy. Um, we think ice was present until about 17,000. The earliest fossils are crane flies followed by tundra and it's a cold and dry climate. And we say dry because we don't see fur coming in that early. Fur is a wetter boreal conifer. We have a lot of sites now that record these dates. Um, we see a fire history. And again, I want to reiterate that all of these dates are on the landscape in the clays prior to when you had the organic sedimentation. I'll just point out one, there have been two papers written since this time about deglaciation here. And in one paper, they quoted our paper incorrectly saying that it's when the land warmed up. So they didn't really uh, read it. They didn't realize that the macrofossil dates were in clays. And the second paper just used all the bulk old dates. So I'm kind of horrified at how this, um, I thought when we published this that the, the, everyone would accept the AMS dates, but people are still tying it somehow to old bulk dates, even though that's been debunked. And so I think we need to move forward by finding more sites. And that's why um, I want to go to Bud Lake, which is right on the moraine. If anybody's interested in helping, that would be great. <laughs> um, because these cores are deep uh, to pull out. And the qu questions, is it possible the landscape was so unstable for all that time that you would, it would be able to accept both the um, rock dates and the lake dates? And we don't think so. We think that um, our record really represents ice retreat, be so, partly because of all the other evidence, the, the sites in the south and the ocean uh, records as well. And I just wanted to point out another thing. In the Malaspina Glacier, there are trees actually growing on top of the glacier today. So you can get trees growing on ice. And in that case, that might have been what happened. I mean, we might have had trees growing um, on top of uh, the glacier itself might have still been there a little bit when we find our, our tree fossils. And finally, a lot of people worked hard in always in helping me and in doing our work. And these are just some of the photos of bogs and coring that we have. And I think I'll stop there and get your questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dee. Very interesting. Should I undo my screen or keep it? <laughs> You can undo it if you want. Okay, let me see where I undo it. Oh, Up there. the top, it should say okay, stop sharing. Yeah. Okay. Is there any impact whether the glacier starts to retreat and then readvances? Um, we don't have any, ev yeah, you can see evidence of that in cores because sometimes you see, um, for example, if in Alaska, I have cores where you can see clays and then a lake formed, and then you get a clay layer on top of that. That means the ice re-advanced and some ice, some clay melted out when the glacier retreated a little bit. I had a colleague 40 years ago who was trying to study the re-advances in the Catskills. Who was that? Um, Steve, I'm trying to remember his last name. Unfortunately, he was coming home from teaching at Fairleigh Dickinson one night. And as usual, he stopped for coffee. And he didn't realize he had backed his car into a snowbank. 
Oh no. Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm sorry. But well, one, uh, of the, well, one of the um, other things we're trying to do is track the timing of deglaciation through the Catskills into the Adirondacks. So I have cores from both and they're really younger. I mean, the oldest state in the Adirondacks so far is 10,000. The Catskills, it's about 15. Mm -hmm. So um, we need to do more coring up there too. Yeah. Well, if you need volunteers, send me information and I'll share it through the list. That would be great, yeah. Because it's always fun to core. <laughs> You never know what you're going to find. I think that's what's fun. OK. <laughs> Any other questions out there? Uh, yes, I have one, Richard. Um, you have to identify a wide range of plants and animals. Uh, do you get help with that, or you just have an encyclopedic knowledge of? Oh, no. I have. Oh. I have to get help. I have a huge, I'm very lucky. I have a huge seed collection that was given to me that has over 4,000 species. And one of the really important things I want to do is get that online. But I haven't gotten the money to a grant to do that. But it needs to be photographed so that other people can do this. Um, but as a botanist, I love plants and I love, they're beautiful, right? There are plenty of pollen uh, online databases. Um, and I have a collection of modern pollen too. But, but yeah, you really have to have, you know, the seed to compare it to, to know. So that's another job that I haven't finished, yeah. Additional questions? I think yes, it's a great help. thing Philip? for kids to do, yeah. Yeah. The, um, the cause for the fires uh, on the on the uh, in the forest surfaces are is what what causes this is just lightning strikes? Well, it could be early people too. I okay, mean, yeah. Know, right? We okay. don't know. So I think, you know, we know people were here. Well, you'd know better than me. How far back? In the late glacial, right? Yes. There's um there is a site called Cactus Hill in Virginia with dates around 175, which are uh, is pre-Clovis. There's right. also Meadowcroft Rock Shelter right. in southwestern PA. Right. With age dates a little beyond 175. Um and um, and so you see a pioneering effort at around 17 or 18 or so. Yeah, and you know, I've always wondered, one of my questions is, does the ice leave the high part first or the valleys? Because you know, in the spring, when you fly over, you see the hills deglaciated. Right. <laughs> but the lowlands, and so I think that's an interesting, the people would have probably moved it at high It'd be easier to walk at high. Yes. In the higher parts. Yes. So, the um, the lithic inventory as well, the raw materials, um, uh, hint towards uh, southeastern raw material sources. Really. Some of which are submerged on the uh, Florida shelf, cool. uh, on the, particularly on the west coast of Florida, and so there there are there's just a sprinkling a peppering of sites but they have a very interesting age range at around 17 17 oh. five wow. yeah we're seeing them of course many of them are highly debatable however um um uh, they are present uh cactus hill of which i think is studied the uh, and autovasio is, is published uh meadowcroft right. yeah um there was a fellow in the SUNY system at Oneonta um, many years ago who had objects from glacial features in near the Unadilla region. Where is Unadilla? Um, not far on the Susquehanna from Oneonta. Oh, okay. Huh. 
And um, unfortunately, much of his work was discounted. Huh. However, the family has his research and the collections. Interesting. And he felt that the um, pre-Clovis material had been deposited during some type of interstadial or readvancement over the over the site had taken place. Interesting. Possibly the Salamanca reentrant or something mm -hmm. on that order. Right. However, all the work was discounted later on. However, the material still exists. That's great. Yeah. Because yeah. new techniques come up too. So it's great. If, of yeah. course. Of course. We have additional uh, questions. Someone asked about the pollen, the magnification. It's 400 times uh, because we're using the high power scope. So pollen's taken at 400 magnification. Dee, do you have uh, summer interns? Do I? In your lab? Yes, yeah. I have three this year, I think. Yeah, Good. we've been doing remotely, but um, macrofossil work, they send me photos. <laughs> and we actually did get in the field too and core some socially distanced. Well, I often get requests from college and high school students about possible internships. Yeah, usually I, I'm full. <laughs> I usually take several. So, um, or, you know, Dallas's program is one. Right. And I have a NASA program of high school teacher, student, and undergrad, um, which works really well. And grad student, they work together well. So that's good too. Excellent. Thank you very much. Sure. Thanks for all your attention. <laughs> and I look forward to hearing you again on Tuesday. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. To explain that, Dee is going to be giving a talk to my Rotary Club on Tuesday. Ah, okay. It's the same talk. So you're not missing anything if you, yeah. Um, so we will edit this and post it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dorothy. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, thanks very so much. much. I'll end things now. <laughs> thanks so much. Thanks. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Sure the class will be on May 1st. Thank you, Mike. We'll have Dallas. Thanks. Okay. Bye all. Bye-bye.